Hi guys, in this video we'll look at structural polysaccharides, cellulose, molecular structure of cellulose, hydrogen bonding in cellulose, fibres of cellulose, cellulose as a fibre, and then we'll finish with a summary. So polysaccharides not only act as an energy store, but they can have structural roles as well. And we're going to explain this using the example of cellulose. So they can have a structural role in organisms, mainly such as plants. And in plants, we see a common element or a common polysaccharide, which is called cellulose. And it's important for the overall structure of the plant. If we look at a plant cell wall, the cell wall is made up from a polysaccharide known as cellulose. And remember, the cell wall is what surrounds the entire plant cell, kind of like a casing around all of the cell membrane, cytoplasm, and the organelles inside. Cellulose itself, as a polysaccharide, is a very, very strong material, and it stops the plant cells from bursting whenever they fill up with water. The water enters by osmosis, and it makes the cells turgid rather than bursting open. So to explain that, if we look at a plant cell here, if water is plentiful, then water enters the cell from the outside and water does this by osmosis. If an animal cell were to change the amount of water this much, it would simply burst open and die. But instead what happens is, as the water swells up, it pushes up against the cell wall, and the cell wall prevents the plant cell from bursting. It kind of holds its shape, but it still swells up, and this is given uh, the name of being turgid. So plant cells become turgid. It's important that plant cells do swell up like this because this turgidity provides enough strength and support for every single cell in the plant so that the whole plant can be supported. So if we look at a plant here, we can see that cells are nice and turgid and the stem has this nice rigid upright structure keeping this plant nice and tall so it can find the sunlight. If the cells are not turgid or there's not enough water or there's a problem with the cellulose, then we see that most of the plant cells become limp and very weak. So the plant tends to droop, and we call this wilting. So this kind of highlights the idea that plants need both water and their cell walls made of cellulose in order to be a nice, turgid, upright structure. Whereas if they lose either of these, the swelling or the cellulose, then they lose their upright structure, and they tend to look like this. So in order to understand why cellulose is good as a structural polysaccharide, we need to understand the molecular structure. So cellulose itself is made up of thousands and thousands of beta-glucose isomer molecules joined together by 1,4 glycosidic bonds. So in another video we talked about how starch was made up of alpha-glucose molecules. The crucial point in cellulose is that it's beta-glucose, not alpha. So let's look at the chain here. Each of these represents a beta-glucose, this hexagonal shape, and they're linked together by the bonds which connect monosaccharides, which are the glycosidic bonds. And again, as for every monosaccharide, we name or we number the carbons from 1 to 6. So this would be carbon 1 of 1 beta-glucose and carbon 4 of the other. And because of this, we have a 1,4 glycosidic bond between beta-glucoses. And this makes, overall, a cellulose chain, where a cellulose chain is a long chain of these beta-glucoses all lined up. What you'll notice, though, is that a lot of the beta-glucoses are inverted. To be able to form these 1,4 glycosidic bonds, each of the beta-glucose molecules must be inverted 180 degrees, or flipped upside down, from the previous molecule. So looking back at this chain, what you can hopefully spot is that we've got a glycosidic bond down here, and then it's up here, and then it's down here, and then it'll be up there. So every time we do this, the beta-glucose next to it has flipped around. This one is then upside down, this one's the right way up, etc, etc, and it keeps alternating like this. So in this case, what we have are beta-glucose next to another beta-glucose. But the problem is we need to have the OHs facing each other. So this one needs to flip around or invert. So now it's in the correct orientation. And now we can take this to form the water in the condensation reaction. And then this can join to form that glycosidic bond. So in order to get these proper glycosidic bonds between one and four carbons, we need the next glucose to basically invert 180 degrees. So these inversions of every alternative glucose keep cellulose from coiling up, and it results in a long, straight chain. So when we were talking about amylose, we were talking about a helix structure where the alpha glucose were binding to each other in the same way every time, and they form this coiled structure. However, in cellulose, what we have this time are the beta glucose each flipping around every time, inverting 180 degrees. 
And because of this, it keeps the whole chain straight and uncoiled. So each cellulose chain is straight. We also have hydrogen bonding in cellulose, which is important for its overall integrity. So as we said before, each of the cellulose chains are straight because of the inversion of those beta glucoses. So this means that all of the chains are in line with each other and they can line up parallel to each other. So here we would have one cellulose chain and then here we've got other chains which can lie parallel. So you can see that because they're straight and they're following the same direction, they can line up parallel to each other in lots and lots of rows in a tight space. If this was the case for amylose where they're all coiled up, it's much harder to line them up in a neat way. What we then find is because they've all lined up, we get these hydroxyl groups or OH groups which are in close proximity to each other. So here's one cellulose chain, here's the one running parallel to it, and the next one, and so on and so forth. And what you'll see is that there are hydroxyl groups that are in close proximity to each other from one chain to the next. These two these ones, and so on and so forth. So these are hydroxyl groups. And these are important because between these hydroxyl groups we can form hydrogen bonds between hydroxyl groups on the adjacent chains. So let's say that this is chain one, missing most of the molecule, but we've got this hydroxyl group on the end, and this is chain two, and we have these hydroxyl groups sticking out from either one in close proximity to each other. We've covered hydrogen bonds in our water videos, but let's just quickly recap what happened. In a bond between oxygen and hydrogen, the oxygen tends to attract the electrons more, making the hydrogen delta positive and the oxygen slightly delta negative. So they have a bit of polarity to them. And because opposite forces attract each other, the oxygen and the hydrogen form a hydrogen bond. And if you can imagine this is happening between all of those hydroxyl groups, which were in close proximity to each other. What this results in is a cross-linking between all of the cellulose chains. So those chains are no longer existing just independently and parallel to each other. They're now cross-linked via all of these hydroxyl groups with a hydrogen bond. So we would have a hydrogen bond here, one there, there, etc. between all of these O's and H's. And overall, the chains get lots of cross-links. So even though each individual hydrogen bond is quite a weak intermolecular force, there are many, many thousands of these running along between chains. So the collection of the hydrogen bonds makes cellulose very strong. So if it was all held by one single hydrogen bond, it would be very, very weak. But when you add up that these are all containing various hydrogen bonds between each of the chains, it's overall very strong, even though each individual H bond is weak. And obviously we want cellulose to be strong because it can then withstand all of that swelling that happens in the plant cells. It must be strong. Cellulose arranges itself in certain ways as well. So we've talked about hydrogen bonds cross-linking cellulose chains, and then those chains can form into stronger fibers. To imagine this, it helps to think of a rope where we've got individual cellulose chains. And these chains, when they come in close proximity and are tightly compacted together, they can form these kind of fibril-like structures and then these fibrils can come together to form an even thicker fibre. And overall, when it all adds up, the rope itself is very, very strong, even though an individual cellulose chain is very, very weak. So it's about having multiple layers and multiple factors of strength rather than how strong an individual bond actually is. So first of all, let's talk about the hierarchy. The cellulose chains first bundle together to form microfibrils. So, looking at these beta chains which we had before, so this is a cellulose chain, and again we've got this parallel lining up where we've got one chain here, we've got another chain here, and these are, remember, cross-linked to each other with hydrogen bonds. So basically, when we look at a diagram, each of these here is a cellulose chain, and what happens is a lot of these cellulose chains all come together and get packed into a single structure, and this is what we call a microfibril. So this contains lots of beta cellulose chains, all connected via lots of hydrogen bonds. So already we've got a nice level of strength here. The next layer up is that microfibrils are then bundled together to form larger fibres called macrofibrils, or fibres. So what you can see then is we've got lots and lots of microfibrils bundled together, and this overall is a macrofibril. 
macro meaning large, micro meaning smaller. So micro is always the smaller one. This is also called just a fiber. So you can see there's lots of bundling together and lots of structures in biology form this kind of structure. So the macrofibrils, or these large fibers, then wrap around the plant cells in lots of different layers, at different angles as well. So here we're looking at the surface of a plant cell, and we're looking at part of the cell wall. And each one of these is one of those macrofibrils. So they've already got each of them packed with microfibrils and all of those betas, glucose, cellulose chains. And you can see they're all running, connected to each other, but then the next layer might run in the opposite direction, and then the layer underneath that might go diagonally. But overall, as these layers build up, you can imagine it's like a very complicated, thick wicker basket. And this confers a huge amount of strength. And this is important because as that plant cell swells with water, it's going to need something strong around it to withstand it from bursting. And it's the wrapping, like a kind of basket structure, of the strong cellulose fibres around the plant cell, providing extra strength to the plant cell wall. Let's talk about cellulose on a more global level. So cellulose as an organic molecule is the main component of plant cells. And because there are so many plants across the planet, it's the most abundant organic material found in the world. The trouble is though, cellulose as a fibre is not an easily digestible food, because it's very hard to break down by hydrolysis. So remember, with the polysaccharide, or the cellulose, in order to break down the glucoses and remove them, we have to take them off by hydrolysis. But a lot of animals cannot do this because it's a very strong material and it's hard to break these bonds. The reason we can't do it is because we lack a certain enzyme. Most enzymes lack the enzyme cellulase, which breaks that 1,4 glycosidic bonds between the beta-glucoses. So here's one single beta-glucose. And of course, here is our 1,4 glycosidic bonds. And in order to snip these bonds, we need cellulase to break it down. And if it can do this, it's good because then that beta-glucose can enter respiration. But a lot of animals don't have the right enzyme for this, and so they can't do it. Some herbivores, though, you'll notice eat plants all the time. So they have to have a way of doing this. So they have symbiotic bacteria in their guts, which do produce this enzyme. So symbiotic bacteria means that they live alongside them and they benefit each other. The bacteria benefits from the environment of the stomach of the cow or the herbivore. And the cow benefits because the bacteria produce cellulase. And when the cow eats certain plants and all those cell walls get thrown into the gut, then they can be broken down into glucose, specifically beta-glucose. And then the cow can obviously use this as an energy source. So this means that herbivores can digest a larger proportion of their diet and from this gain more energy through respiration. But we also need cellulose as well because in the human diet, cellulose provides fiber in our diet and this is needed to keep the digestive system healthy. So we of course don't have the cellulase enzyme, but we do eat fiber, which even though it doesn't get digested, it does keep our digestive tract a lot more healthy than usual. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revise smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.